end up in a sukkah village, those ones you have to reserve uh, your space, but, but please be uh, a part of it. And we're also resuming outdoor kiddush uh, on a regular basis, beginning with Sukkot. Shmini uh, Atzeret and Simchat Torah, we also have plans. We're going to have uh, a slightly modified form of hakafot, uh, be a little more distance for the singing and the dancing, but we're going to do uh, something, uh, and we're having a before uh, Sukkot on um, that Monday, that Tuesday evening, um, we're going to have uh, a, an out, uh, a barbecue uh, as well. Um, also, good policy, please be aware of the emergency exits um, that are in the room in the unlikely event that we need to use them. Mi shalo ra'a beit hamikdash bevinyano, lo ra'a binyan mefo'ar me'olam. Anyone who didn't see the holy temple when it stood never saw a magnificent structure in his life. Said Abaye, and some say it was Rav Chista, Zebinyan Hordos. This statement refers to the construction of Herod. It wasn't the first temple that Solomon built, and certainly not the second temple, the small one that the returning exiles put up when they were permitted to do so. The most glorious temple was the refurbished and enlarged version of the second temple, which Herod completed about 500 years later, in 10 BCE. But that glorious structure was a long time coming. The people first had to contend with what we might call survivor's guilt. Let's go back more than 2,500 years to 518 BCE, not to Yom Kippur, but to Sukkot, in the second year of the reign of King Darius I of Persia, The Jewish people were celebrating Hoshana Rabbah, the last day of the festival in their newly completed second temple. Priests and Levites were stationed with symbols to give glory to God as King David of Israel had once ordained. They sang songs to praise God, Ki Tov, for God is good, Ki Le'olam Chasdo, God's steadfast love is eternal. The people sounded trumpets and sang joyously at the top of their lungs to celebrate the establishment of their new temple, but not everyone. The book of Ezra describes how priests and Levites and clan heads who had known the first temple wept loudly at the sight of this newly erected building. Rashi explains that these older folks could not rejoice with the young celebrants because they remembered what was. They knew what the temple was supposed to look like. They remembered the pain of seeing that building destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's armies. They couldn't find joy in this tiny facsimile, the the cash-strapped community of Judeans and returnees from Babylon had put up. Understanding the feelings of these older Jews, the prophet Haggai offered a message of hope. Who is left among you who saw this house In its former splendor, he preached. How does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing to you. But be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, O high priest, son of Jehoshadak. Be strong, people of the land, says the Lord, and act. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. So I promised you when I came out of Egypt, my spirit is still in your midst. Fear not. Al-Tirah. The world is not quite like it once was, the prophet admitted. But fear not, we will press on with our world as it is. We will maintain faith in the world as it should be, and perhaps someday. I think about Haggai's hopeful, empathetic message in light of one of the stories I read in the Washington Post supplement honoring the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Raymond Pfeiffer was a firefighter with Manhattan's Engine 40 Ladder 35 unit. On 9-11, though, he was not at the station. As he had done numerous times before, Ray traded his shift that day with Stephen Mercado, a comrade with whom he had traded many shifts before. Ray spent the day golfing with other firefighters. 
Of course, when they made the trade, neither could have possibly predicted that September 11, 2001 would have been so different from any other day. But the swap plagued Ray for years because Stephen Mercado was in the South Tower when it collapsed. Ray Pfeiffer was never the same. He became withdrawn, short-tempered, depressed, at times angry. Family members noticed that Ray was unable to enjoy family celebrations or important life moments. Maybe he shared something in common with those older Jews who remembered the glorious times before their holy temple was destroyed. In losing a friend, along with 332 other firefighters, Ray Pfeiffer lost a part of himself. People advised him to move on, but how could he? The future could never compete with the past. What was lost could never be brought back. It became impossible to imagine something brighter. But over time, things did change. It took many years, but two things happened. The first was terribly unfortunate. Around 2010, Ray was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, which doctors say was likely caused by months of exposure to all the toxins at ground zero. What started in the bladder had spread throughout his body and to his bones, and most people would have greeted that diagnosis with fear or despair, but not Ray Pfeiffer. For him, it somehow brought a sense of calm because he no longer felt that he had somehow been spared the suffering of 9-11. As his wife Karen described it, Ray accepted the illness almost as divine punishment. Now he could share his suffering with his comrades. Now, I don't quite agree with his theology of divine punishment, but I can appreciate the sentiment or at least draw a lesson as I hope others who might have experienced this survivor's guilt might do. The lesson is that no person's life is entirely good and devoid of pain. And the opposite is also true. Pain and suffering are not divine punishment. Joy and health are not divine reward because the world doesn't work that way. Which means that when we do experience pain, we're not alone. We're not singled out. And when we experience the blessings that inevitably follow, we need not feel guilty finding joy in them. Joy and pain are part of every life. We must give ourselves ex a permission to experience both. That younger generation celebrating Sukkot in that structurally inferior second temple had no reason to be ashamed of their joy. The new temple did not replace the first. It was not as large or as, be as beautiful, but the joys experienced within its walls were every bit as real. It's okay to live again, even when we promise never to forget. The second thing that helped Ray's transformation is that he got involved in a project to make a difference in the world. Ray obviously couldn't bring back his fallen comrades, after surgery on his leg, he couldn't fight fires either, but he found a new purpose. Ray became an advocate for families of 9-11 first responders who died, including the family of Stephen Mercado, the one with whom he had traded that shift. Ray rode his wheelchair from office to office on Capitol Hill and lobbied senators to vote for extending fund to extend funding for benefits that were set to expire. You can imagine how effective his lobbying was. Eventually, the cancer took its toll and Ray died in the spring of 2017, but he had become a different person. Days before his death, Ray described to a friend how he was feeling. I can't complain, he said. I'm a lucky guy. For al it was almost 16 years since 9-11, but what a transformation. Ray Pfeiffer was still the recipient of the same raw deal, but he came to understand that it's okay to live on after a loved one has passed. And not just okay, but necessary. Parts of life will never be the same, but there will be new joys to experience, especially if we can muster a sense of purpose. 
In our tradition, remembering Yizkor is linked to tzedakah. We say in the liturgy, Hineni no dev tzedakah, in loving testimony to the lives of my loved ones, I pledge tzedakah to help perpetuate ideals important to them. Through such deeds and through prayer and remembrance, may their souls be bound up in the bond of life. We hold the key to the storerooms that fill the emptiness. We can fill the void with kindness, acts of Torah, acts of tzedakah, that perpetuate the legacies of loved ones and remind us that our lives are worth living. Last Shabbat in the synagogue, we read Moses' announcement to the Israelites after he had, when he, that he had reached the end of his road. Lo uchal od latzeit velavo, he said, I can no longer move in and out. And God has told me I will not cross the Jordan to the other side. And Moses calls to Joshua and he tells him, Chazak ve'ematz, be strong and courageous. You can do this. You will lead the people to the promised land where you will experience joy. God will be with you as God was with me. Just do not fear. Do not be distressed. And then, perhaps sensing the rest of the people might become debilitated by the pain of his, of, of, and void of his absence, Moses offers one last commandment. Hakel. Hakel. Every seventh year on the seventh day of uh, every seventh year on Sukkot, Hakel, you are going to gather all the people, men, women, children, strangers, and you're going to read the Torah that I gave you. Moses may be gone, he says, but the teachings will live on. There is purposeful work to be done. We can be inspired by the legacies of our loved ones. In a completely different context, Emily Pearl Kingsley, a longtime advocate for individuals with disabilities, wrote a piece about what it's like to raise a child with a disability. The experience of preparing for the baby, she writes, is like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and make wonderful plans. It's all very exciting. And then the plane lands, and someone says over the loudspeaker, Welcome to Holland. It takes time. You learn to adjust. And then you realize that even though Holland is not Italy, it's a beautiful place in its own right. And there's so much to appreciate and love. The piece is a little dated, but it speaks a truth. Life takes us in different directions, and sometimes the circumstances are difficult. Certain disappointments or pains never, ever, ever go away, she concludes. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to go to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, the very lovely things about Holland. We faced similar issues when we were forced to adapt to the realities of COVID. It wasn't easy to move lives online. Many of us are eager to move back to the way things were. It still isn't easy. And the road ahead will be marked by its own challenges. Will there be more people attending services than before or fewer? Will Zoom and live stream continue to be such an important part of our community? Will we ever fully recover from all the disruptions, the loss? It will take time. It behooves us to remember that even on our altered path, our core values remain the same. Even on Zoom, our commitments to Torah, chesed, community, Israel, the Jewish future, love for one another, will keep us together. Rabbi Jack Reamer points to a short narrative from the Book of Kings. After King Solomon has died and the kingdom split, his son Rechavam was left to rule the much smaller southern kingdom of Judah. And that wasn't the worst of it. In the fifth year of King Rechavam's reign, we read, King Shishak of Egypt marched against Jerusalem and carried off the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He carried off everything. He even carried off all the golden shields that Solomon had made. The small kingdom of Judah had become defenseless. They lost everything, and this poor king was left holding the bag. But we read in the very next verse, King Rechavam had bronze shields made instead. He entrusted them to the officers of the guard who guarded them. 
guarded the entrance to the royal palace. Rechavam didn't have the money to replace the golden shields. There was no going back to the glorious heyday of Solomon, but the future was not lost. Rechavam worked with what he had to create new shields. He endowed them with sanctity and temple worship and other essential services of the kingdom continued unabated. Anyone who never saw the holy temple when it stood never saw a magnificent structure in his life. A Midrash imagines God approaching the ruins of the temple and crying out in tears, Oily al-Bayti, woe is me for my house that has been destroyed. My children, where are you? My Levites, my priests, where are you? According to the Midrash, God was inconsolable, resolved to join the people in exile. The second temple was no replacement for the first, but it became the centerpiece of a new communal life. Fortunes changed, the community grew, Herod enlarged it to the point that it became more spectacular than even the first. But that also wouldn't last. We still mourn the destruction of the temple. We visit its ruins in Jerusalem. We face them when we pray from here. The facsimiles we create, the menorah, the eternal flame to remember the ark or the, the, the fire that burned on the altar, the cover for the ark, are like Rechavam's bronze shields when compared to the golden ones they replaced. We remember, and yet we've moved forward with Torah and prayer, new ways to express connections to our people and our God. We can never replace the past. At Yiskor, we remember parents who died too young and left us stranded and without direction. We remember spouses who loved and supported us and left seemingly insurmountable voids in our lives. We remember children, tragically plucked away, had us wishing it were us instead. We remember grandparents and aunts and uncles who impacted us in ways we can't adequately describe to the next generation. But time does not freeze for us as it did for them. Time moves on, life moves on, We owe it to ourselves to appreciate all that is now, even as we remember the glory that was, what could have been. 20 years after 9-11, 1,951 years after the destruction of the Second Temple, days, months, or years after countless personal tragedies, we live on for the perpetuation of Torah and community and values generations have passed to us. I pray in the words of Haggai, Chazak, be strong. Remember the promise of our God whose spirit still stands in our midst. I pray in the words of Moses, Chizku v'imtsu, al tiru al ta'aritsu, be strong and courageous, have no fear and have no dread, for Adonai, your God, marches with you. God will not fail us, God will not, stre- will not forsake us, Be strong and courageous. I pray in the words of our tradition, Gemar Chatima Tova, may each of us be inscribed for goodness and blessing in the year that awaits us. Amen. We'll turn now to the Yizkur service. Wait just a moment. Line change. going to begin with a prayer that's on the booklets in your seats for